<clears throat> so I, my journey started in Hyderabad in Pakistan, where I think I was 11 years old in sixth grade, where I got exposed to a PDB-11. PDB-11 is one of the old school computers that was installed at the Atomic Energy Medical Center in Jamshoro for nuclear medicine gamma camera uh, applications. But as typical, um, you know, this is what, early, late 70s, early 80s, um, that uh, the interface that uh, connected the camera to the computer never came. So there was a computer sitting at Atomic Energy not being used for the clinical application. So my first exposure to computer was in the context of healthcare. I learned how to code on that computer because just sit there, do nothing uh, as part of my, um, uh, that's another long story why even I was there and um, learn how to do, the, obviously the first program I wrote was the game Hangman on this PD-11 computer. And the journey kind of went from there. Uh, that kind of gave me exposure to in technology in particular part of healthcare. And can, can you imagine this is Jamshoro, Pakistan, where I'm getting exposed to technology and healthcare for the first time in sixth grade as 11 year old. Um, so I always seen healthcare as a very technology focused. I ended up going to Aachen as my, for my med school. And again, same thing. By this time, I had already built software uh, for enterprise. I had, um, I had a software company that was doing um, uh, exam management system that I acquired just before I went to Aachen. Uh, and ah, and I got sucked into literally my second week there into some kind of data analytics projects uh, from faculty. Because can you imagine 1990, a med student who knows how to code was a pretty rare occasion in Pakistan, right? So, so much so that when I left, my final year thesis was on data mining. So did one of the first mainframe data mining projects in ah, and to show that you can actually do total quality improvement projects on financial outcomes and those infections purely using data from mainframe. And these mainframe used to be an old Meditech system that required punch cards to, to program this. So it was that kind of all that, that old stuff. Uh, and then the, the database that that Meditech uh, system used was called MUMPS. It was built at MGH by um, uh, two informa informatics physicians. I didn't know who they were. So, but as learning the database and how to do this stuff, I would email them because their contact information was available in the manual. And they would respond back to me. And what I'd learned later on that these were the gods of informatics in, in the US. So it was uh, Octo Barnett and Bob Greenis. Bob Greenis ended up being uh, chair of biomedical imaging at Harvard University. And Octo was head of informatics at Columbia. I, I didn't know who they were. I was, thought, I was just emailing support people <laughs> and asking them questions. And they never responded as if they were some big shots. So, and again, this is pre-internet day. So I couldn't even Google and find who they were, right? So that was my exposure, understanding uh, databases and EMR, again, all in Pakistan. I did my medicine training at uh, my inter internship at NYU. And again, because of um, uh, my exposure to mumps, when I was at the VA as one of my rotations, they were implementing the new CPRS uh, EMR over there. And my first rotation at the VA was in the ICU. And you know, my first weekend, I had 12 patients in the ICU to take care of. And I went home post-call at 5 p.m. on a weekend. And I made a decision that that's not happening again. I need to figure out how to optimize my process. So I wrote a template-based uh, reporting application to expedite my uh, progress notes. And um, immediately, next thing I know, my internship got converted into electives in IT. And I worked with the VA uh, IT department at Heinz VA here in Chicago to build what is now the template-based uh, progress note in, uh, in CPRS. Um, so again, very earlier on, I got sucked into EMR. And again, because a VA CPRS is also based on MUMS database, gave me a lot of advantage to understand how the database worked. I did my radiology residency at Geisinger. And uh, same thing, as a first-year resident, I was asked to help find the PACs. So chaired the PAC selection committee at Geisinger as a first year radiology resident, selected a beta PACs out of UPMC uh, built by Paul Chang uh, called Stentor. And we were the first site outside UPMC that implemented that PACs and, uh, and did really well. And after that, they wanted to go to electronic health record. And um, again, the CIO asked me to be on the EMR selection committee. We ended up investing in a small startup out of Madison, Wisconsin, because nobody could uh, satisfy our RFP. Remember, uh, Geisinger was a HMO, so a lot focused on quality-based care, not fee-for-service models, 
a lot of the RFP requirements of use cases were all quality initiatives that at that time no EMR was addressing because they were all built as billing systems. So the startup that we invested in at that time was called Epic. Um, and the rest, you know how, how that happened, right? Um, and again, Epic was also based on MOMS database. So it gave me a huge advantage, really understanding how the system is integrated and a lot of work with the engineering team to make that work. I then decided I, by this time, you know, I was doing, my focus was on uh, cardiac MR as my main clinical specialty. Uh, again, I was focusing mostly on pediatric uh, cardiac MR at that time. And I thought that's what I'm going to do as my clinical career. But then um, I think my wife convinced me like, like, like you know, there are only seven people in the world who care about your cardiac MR research. But this IT committee meeting you go to and everybody sings your song. So why are you resisting uh, career in that? Uh, because as you see from a journey, right? I never thought in inform informatics as my career in the early days. So I finally gave in and I, I thought that there needs to be some kind of training program in informatics. I also had what, I, what we call now the imposter syndrome that didn't think I've gone through, you know, undergrad education or college education on computer science, so I probably don't know anything. So um, convinced the chair at University of Maryland <clears throat> to start the first imaging informatics training program. And he said, I'll start it if you come and run it. So instead of doing a fellowship, I ended up starting a fellowship at University of Maryland uh, in combination with the Baltimore VA. The, the claim to fame in Baltimore VA is that that was the world's first filmless hospital. That when, when it opened the doors in 1992, it did not have a film library. So a lot of the early packs uh, implemented all Maryland nation's first imaging in the country. Junaid, we may have lost connection with our speaker. Is he breaking up for you? Yeah, I, I don't see him, Dr. Siddiqui, anymore <clears throat> in the group. That's, I was actually checking my own Wi-Fi. It seems like... Um... Oh, there have been a reset. Sorry. Not sure what So happened. we were actually at the VA Geisinger, Maryland, and when you created your fellowship, and right after that, sort of, we lost you. So if you don't mind getting there. Sure, I'll go back there. I have no idea what happened. Uh, could be a Wi-Fi restart. So anyway, so, you know, ended up, um, uh, as I said, can create country's first informatics training program. A lot of track transfer happened out of that. A lot of startups came out of it. One of them that I led, was initially called Yara Look. It was an international language processing based startup that then renamed as Montage and then sold to Nuance Communication. I then got recruited by Hopkins to start build the Center for Biomedical Imaging Informatics and Center for Technology Innovation, as well as the software tech transfer office at Johns Hopkins. So did that with um, more than 40 million in annual tech transfer that happened at Hopkins. Um, and at this time, we did some very interesting work in AI, and uh, we, I got recruited then by Microsoft uh, to come and uh, start the medical imaging efforts as well as the machine learning AI efforts in 2007 8 uh, timeframe. And I'll come back and show what we did at Microsoft. I left Microsoft in 2012 to start my next company called Higgy. It's a medical kiosk that you see in grocery stores and pharmacies in North America. Um, scaled that company to about uh, 11,000 of these devices deployed. Uh, in retail pharmacies and health systems uh, with uh, over 70 million patients on the PHR and, um, uh, and exited that in 2018. Then a uh, bunch of my former colleagues from Microsoft decided to start a data AI company. So uh, I'm chairman of that company and 
and got on a bunch of boards and started doing some investing. Uh, and then in 2019, I got approached by Dr. Jonathan Rothberg, who was starting this crazy idea of uh, getting an MRI scanner to the patient's bedside and join Hyperfine um, as the chief medical officer and chief strategy officer to help get the device through regulatory process and commercialize it. So as you can see, you know, I've been done a lot of different things. So what I'll do is I'll walk you through just one aspect of it, how things evolve, right? So I've always had this thought process that, you know, GPS has changed how we look at data, right? Just imagine if you had Excel spreadsheets every morning with road traffic data, with each street and the speed, and you had to figure out which, you know, what route to take to work, you would have no idea. You would not be able to do this. But guess what in healthcare, what do we do in healthcare? That's what we do, right? We get spreadsheets of data with lab values and medications, all the stuff, and now we have to compute in our head what is happening in the patient. And this, we have this vision that if you can, if you can represent the data in a more of a GPS manner on a human body, AKA medical images, you can probably have a better understanding of, and correlation understanding of what is happening in, in the body. So we started this work on uh, machine learning in 2003 to um, automatically classify CT scans based on anatomic regions. So you can represent data based on that. Um, I won't go into details. It's the whole story, how this even happened and started because GPUs to do machine learning didn't exist in this time. So we were creating our custom proprietary FPGA car to do this work. And, um, and, and that led to you know, a lot of different works, right? Automated classification of images and endromic regions, automated hanging protocols and processing based on now that you know what, uh, what organ is in the image, you can change window levels automatically. You can create uh, you know, 3D post-processing uh, applications to run automatically. You can create hanging protocols that happen automatically based on what you're looking at. And, um, and then we went, went even further, like can we classify a disease directly? So this was work to classify a meniscal injury and um, uh, in, uh, on EMRs um, with high probability. And you can see here's just one of the prototypes that we had done using machine learning to classify images and be able to represent that in an appropriate manner. So these were early deep perceptron networks. This is before neural networks were the hype, right? This was all uh, based on SVM regression for us and, um, and deep circuit networks. Those are the early versions of network that existed at that time. So in, in when I got into Microsoft, one of the projects we had was to how do you create photorealistic 3D imaging? Right? This is used to be how images look like, right? And if you talk about 2008 timeframe, 3D data looked like that, you know, looked nice, we thought it was great, but it didn't represent how, if you open the patient up, you know, during surgery, how do the organs look like? And uh, taking advantage of the Xbox team and some of the Microsoft research folks, they were working on photorealistic, you know, um, scenes in movies and in games. Like, how do we take advantage of all this amazing 3D uh, stuff that is happening and bring into healthcare? And that, and and how do we do it in a manner that is very high performing? Does not require, you know, gigantic, you know, workstation to do this. How do you do it through the web? And that led to creating the GPU-based volume rendering. And we really had to start from scratch. So Toby Sharp on my team rewrote the Coda codec, the codec that is used to program GPUs. Um, so NVD had just come out of the Tesla card and he just to get the uh, rendering to work really, really, really fast, rewrote the whole thing, what is called assembly language, basically is ones and zeros. And so this is now a prototype from 2009. Uh, about 12 years ago, and just look at the frame rate on how, oh, if I can play it. And this is, I'm showing this uh, sitting in uh, Washington DC, if it plays, uh, where data set is sitting in uh, Cambridge, UK. So this thing is doing 30 frames per second, 3D, 50, 60 frames per second across the ocean, across the Atlantic Ocean in real time, right? So I'm, this is all running in a browser on my computer, whereas the data set and, this, and the cloud, the, the infrastructure GPU is sitting in UK. And that was, that was the whole idea, how do you do photorealistic 3D? By learning how to reprogram a GPU, we decided like, hey, how do we now expedite our machine learning? Can we take advantage of GPU to do that stuff? So this ended up, this is what the conclusion was, the 3D uh, ray casting based 3D photorealistic 3D that we did, we ended up actually 
become this became part of Xbox uh, arsenal, and I think Siemens licensed a lot of the technology from Microsoft for their photorealistic 3D. What do they call cinematic 3D? Is what they call it. So it was all the work that was done uh, at Microsoft to improve medical imaging around them. So we then applied the same techniques uh, to expedite uh, machine learning on GPU. So this is one of the early versions of automated recognizing anatomic structures on CT scans uh, at 200 frames per second. So basically as the scan is getting done, you're automatically classifying which organs were just scanned. And uh, so you could stop the scanning in real time if you've already covered the body part or you can automatically generate reports based on what you're looking at. So there were a lot of interesting ideas on how to do this. Again, the, the vision of how do you create a GPS for the human body? And you know this led to a lot of different things. Uh, and again, the, the big thing was that this is not uh, image segmentation. We were trying to do image recognition uh, to where things are. So in 2009, I got a call from another team in Microsoft that was trying to do the same thing, recognize something, but not in medicine, but in healthcare. And they said, well, we have this problem that we're trying to recognize where the head is, where the hand is. Can you help us figure out how to do this? And so this, the, the image on the right is actually the 13 body part, 26 body part segments that I did as a prototype from this grayscale stuff that they were showing me. And you know, like at that time, I didn't know what the use case was. They just wanted us to see, figure out how to do this segmentation. So this was Jamie Shedden, Antonio Criminacy on my team at that time, working with us, Toby Sharp, all of these were on the team at, at Microsoft uh, working on this. And I'm sure you can guess what this is. This ended up becoming the foundation technology to recognize humans during uh, gameplay. So you can see direct work that we were doing in CT scans in medicine and how we use GPUs to do recognition ended up getting translated to Xbox. Uh, before this, they were trying to do a CPU based work to do this and they were running into problems uh, uh, and we ended up expediting a lot of the stuff. And even a lot of people in my team at Microsoft in healthcare didn't know that this was happening because of such a hush hush stealth project and some of us were getting uh, sucked into to support this uh, also. And one of the key thing was we needed a lot of data to train so that we didn't want the, walk, the thing to work out of the you know required training to play a game. And so we had to create synthetic data. So the images on the top are real humans that we've segmented and the images in the bottom are all synthetic data. And you can see some of these patients, the people have like elephantitis type legs and weird shapes, right? So, but uh, we, what we realized was that if you had enough data, it overcomes all the uh, errors um, in recognition, right? So, so we ended up generating 500,000 uh, one hour videos at 24 frames per second. So 24 times, 60 seconds times 60 minutes times 500,000 and trained the model on that massive data set. And we had to build the whole architecture of 100,000 GPUs just to train this model uh, to recognize human body parts. And that, that infrastructure ended up becoming the foundation of Azure machine learning that exists now at Microsoft. So a lot of these early things we were doing trying to solve these problems ended up becoming crucial part of various aspects of Microsoft's technology. And this is the actual work uh, that was published around this on, on using synthetics to tr train. Uh, and then actually at Hyperfine, we're using the same techniques now to train on, uh, on stroke applications uh, for the models that we are building. So again, a lot of this work is translating, you know, you learn from one aspect, go to the next one, innovate over there, learn from there, go to the next one. And that's gonna have been my journey. And what made the whole thing worth is this is one of the early prototypes I brought home for teams to my, my kids to you know see what it is and they're playing a game and all they're doing is popping bubbles. This game never got launched. But I... We're gonna jump with you boy. Yeah. We're gonna jump with you boy. Jump with me. This, this is 2009, right? So I mean, when you do this, when you see this, then all the work you've done, you know, that's your reward and nothing else, right? So that was the exciting part of it. Anyway, I'm gonna stop there. Um, on the journey, my journey there and open up for question and then we can go back to talk about Hyperfine. And its applications in neuroradiology and what's on your roadmap specifically for neuroradiology. As a neuro ICU physician, I'm extremely excited because the portable CAT scanner changed the way I practice medicine and that was a big deal. And I'm looking forward for your MRI machines to show up on different places. Yeah, absolutely, right? I think the vision for Hyperfine really started with Dr. Jonathan Rothberg 
uh, who made who, who invented the next generation sequencing and really made his money in that. And then also in 2011, started uh, Butterfly Networks, which is the point of care ultrasound. And uh, Jonathan approaches the same the problems more from you know somebody in his life, somebody he loves has a problem, and he kind of fixates on it and tries to solve that, uh, and uh, and takes advantage of you know what I call vertical integration and taking advantage of things that have happened in the industry outside of healthcare and how do you bring those learnings into, into another domain. So that led to in 2014, this idea that, you know, there's limited access to high quality care. There's so many people who are living in chronic uh, diseases that can benefit from better way to look at the disease through imaging, through sensing, whatever you want to call it. And then just, you know, two thirds of the world just doesn't have access to imaging, being able to monitor continuously and and do intervene. And all these things are large, expensive, require expensive installations, requires experts to use it, and a lot of training, and then are only available in specialized centers. And then that that is kind of what the vision was. And uh, and the, the conclusion came during that initial discussion in 2014-2015 was that how do we come up with a non-radiating uh, high advanced imaging solution to the patient's bedside. So if you look at MR 1.0, these were permanent magnets, low field, started in the late 70s and the 80s. And then in 1986, Picker, which became GE eventually, commissioned the first uh, superconducting magnet 1.5 Tesla. And then all the research in the ultra low field completely stopped and people start focusing on high field uh, to get imaging. So these you know, machines got bigger, require special uh, rooms, special HVAC units, and a lot of the other issues that are with, um, uh, you know, advanced imaging. And then people kind of completely forgot about, uh, you know, low dose, uh, sorry, low frequent field strength uh, MR for a long time. Uh, I think almost like 2015, where the interest in that again started. And then, so we call what we call now MR 3.0 uh, is bringing that MR capability uh, with advantages of, you know, 40 million increase in uh, compute power, you know, 20 million increase in uh, microelectronics and uh, material science and, um, you know, signal processing and all that stuff that has happened over th three decades or four decades and bring that into uh, to the patient's bedside. So we've released our first portable MRI scanners, FDA cleared in clinical use today, you know, just, just keep deploying <laughs> If you're following us on social media, you can see, you know, pretty much weekly we are deploying new devices everywhere for clinical use. Um, and then, and then we had to really think through from scratch, right? I mean, we had to really, really think through how to think about a device um, that can be affordable, that can be portable. So the first thing we had to figure out is how do we address the requirement for Faraday cage for an MR scanner? Like, how do you remove that? And the reason for Faraday cage is because there's so much RF and electromagnetic radio frequency noise in the environment. Uh, and that's what you're trying to shield for. So you can detect the subtle signal that comes from the hydrogen atoms in the body, like in water molecules, basically in your body. And so we invented noise canceling technology the way your headphones have noise canceling. Uh, we have noise canceling technology that cancels out all the environmental noise. So the monitor in the room, the respirator, uh, the, the ventilator in the room, uh, you know, all the other gadgets and metal does not cause any interference. And, uh, you know, MR is very sensitive to temperature. So we had to figure out how do we measure ambient temperature and correct for that as we are doing imaging. The second biggest problem we had to solve is how do you build a magnet, right? So typically because MR is a low volume device, uh, people make magnets by hand and it takes six months to make one magnet. And if you import them or you manufacture them somewhere else, the transport cost to secure the magnet and all the safety that goes with it just becomes really, really hard. So we decided like, okay, fine. What if we didn't import the magnet and we actually create an assembly robot that assembled it on the assembly line. So we are not importing raw magnets. So this is what you're seeing right now. So the blocks are the raw ore uh, converted into blocks that get shipped so in a box, right? So there are magnets, they're just metal. So no need to do any kind of safety transport of this stuff. And then the thing that is hanging from the ceiling here, this is the, this is the two robotic arms here. This one magnetizes and this one is the big one that essentially cures the magnet on a plate for the magnet builds. So we reduced the manufacturing time from six months to six hours. 
and that's how we can reduce the cost, you know, 20 times reduction in cost of manufacturing magnet and then speed in manufacturing also. So we not only did we invent the technology to do the scanner, but also the technology to build the, the whole machining and the tooling and manufacturing process, we had to reinvent that. I mean, that's how Tesla has evolved, right? It's not just building electric car, it's all the manufacturing of electric car is also what's led to it. And what that enables is scenarios like this, where you can bring the MRI to the patient anywhere, no issues with electronics, IV pumps in the rooms. You know, the image on the left is the North Shore University Hospital is the first COVID deployment we did in April of last year. Uh, this is a neuro ICU patient was a COVID positive patient, had altered mental status changes and they couldn't figure out what to do with it. Uh, and when, we, when this scan was done, there were 110 patients on ventilators that they didn't have a transport ventilator to take a patient down to radiology and plus risk of COVID and all the other stuff. So this was being used over there. The image in the middle is in the, ICE, in the ER at Yale. I mean, look at all the like room electronics and metal in the room. That physician with the iPad is controlling the scanner. It talks wirelessly to the scanner. That's where the console is. Console is an iPad. And by redoing the magnet, re using a permanent magnet and redesigning the gradient coils, we've reduced the power requirement to something similar to a coffee maker or a blender. Right? You can literally plug it in into any wall outlet you want. And we also had to rethink how the user interface works. Right, so We had to make it really simple because this could be used by you know, radiology techs and MR techs. It could be used by a community worker in sub-Saharan Africa and community center. Right, So we had to think through how would somebody do it? So it's a single button scanning. The scanner figures out uh, where the patient's head is. You just hit play and does all the th uh, 3D sequencing on its own. You don't have to go plan the sequence. It has all auto alignment. It has motion detection capabilities. Uh, so to generate diagnostic quality images every single time. And because it's wirelessly connected, data goes immediately to a physician's phone so they can interact with it. We also do what is called progressive rendering. So as scan is happening, as case space is getting filled in, we're generating images. So even though the scan time can be, you know, five minutes to 10 minutes, but you are seeing images within minute, two minutes of scan starting. Uh, and then, you know, we have AI, AI applications through the cloud to help with, uh, you know, assistant diagnosis, uh, as well as uh, viewing capability through a browser-based packs. And obviously we connect to local hospital packs also. Our first clearance is for neuro applications. We do T1, T2, uh, Flare, and um, uh, DWI with ADC map. Uh, we also have our AI application cleared through FDA that does volumetrics. So volumetrics of the ventricles, the brain, midline shift, and things like that automatically. Uh, and we are working on a lot more things in the future. Uh, we are active trials going on for other body parts. Uh, so for C-spine, for extremities, upper and lower extremities, we have trials going on on contrast agents. Uh, so dedicated contrast agents for our uh, device is not cleared through FDA yet, but uh, we're looking at different contrast agents, including ferromoxetol, spion agents, and higher laxative degadolinium for those applications. And we are also trials going on for intervention. Because of our low field strength, we don't have those issues that you see with metal going inside uh, uh, MR uh, environment right here. You can see the needle very clearly going through a lesion in this phantom example here. And just imagine opening up image guided, you know, procedures on the patient's bedside. Right? You can have a scanner right at the bedside and be able to do procedures with image guidance right at the bedside. Um, I mean, we see uh, Hyperfine as an ecosystem, not just a device. You know, we'll keep building new devices for interoperative use, emergency use, screening applications. We'll keep supporting them with AI applications to us to better image quality, reduce imaging time, image guidance, even disease detection. And then we'll have a consumables such as contrast agents and, and procedure kits to be able to do image guidance intervention in the long term. So it's, we think of ourselves as a solving the entire ecosystem of care continuum from monitoring to sensing to diagnosis to therapy. And MR is just our first uh, forte in the, in the vision of where we are. Uh, I don't know if you have time to go through some clinical cases or should I stop? Uh, if you have time, sir, feel free to go ahead. All right, so this is- We this will is record it, put it up for all the people to consume later. Sure, so, um, so I'm gonna start the story in, um, in uh, Blantyre, Malawi. It's one of the sites that has uh, one of our scanners. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Terry, uh, Terry Taylor who runs the Blantyre Malaria Project. They had a GE uh, MR scanner that broke down two years ago. 
and they just couldn't get parts or anything to to repair it and they were really desperate for getting um uh, more scanners so th this is and uh, mercy james uh, institute uh, where they're running this uh, cerebral malaria program and uh, our scanner was delivered to them um on march 11th and here's her tweet that uh, they scanned the first patient four hours after they uncreated it nobody from hyperfine uh, went with the scanner. So we we trained them all remotely and then Dr. Taylor's team uncreated it and uh, scanning, we're scanning patient and saving lives uh, four hours after the crate arriving. I mean, this is unheard of even in the US to be able to do imaging this fast for an MR scanner. So here's a story of 13 year old Malawian a boy who present hospital acute profound, uh, you know, decrease in consciousness. Obviously this is a malaria clinic, right? So they were concerned about cerebral malaria. And here are what the images are. I'm not sure if Dr. Sarvad wants to comment or somebody wants to comment what this is. Uh, again, 13 year old boy with hyper intensities, uh, mostly in the uh, posterior uh, portion of the brain. So this is non cerebral malaria, right? This is press syndrome. And press syndrome is a benign entity. It's uh, good if promptly treated. And all you have to do is reduce the blood pressure. And they immediately recognized it. Uh, treated his blood pressure and uh, patient recovered, right? So here's a classic example of place where there's just no access to imaging and, you know, without doing MR, you would have no idea what is going on with the brain, right? There's just no way CT would have been normal. Everything else would have been normal, labs would have been normal. And if it is not treated, you would have had pretty bad outcome. Uh, here's another one scenario, male presented to MGH. Um, this is now a US scenario, right? In the emergency department with acute change in mental status. Initial workup was done with non-contrast CT. Uh, patient was transferred to the ICU. Uh, nothing, there were some hemorrhage detected on CT and I'll show the images. Um, and, uh, and you know, uh, the EBD was placed just to, for supportive care because they thought nothing can be done for this patient. And then, you know, while this patient was being stabilized to figure out what is else going on, why the bleeding started, they decided to do a soup uh, scanner, uh, one of our scans. So here was the initial intraparenchymal hemorrhage, interventricular hemorrhage. You can see some midline shift. Uh, Diagnosis was hydrocephalus with intraparenchymal and interventricular hemorrhage. But here's our scan, right? So as, as you can see, there's some high signal on flare uh, on, on the right side, but very classic wedge-shaped high intensity diffusion variant imaging, hypo intensity on, on flare. And this would have demonstrated, you know, focal territorial infarct it was not recognized by neurology staff over there. And this was you know, raised diagnosis of superimposed vasospasm due to the hemorrhage. And the patient had balloon angioplasty to open up the vessel and recover the stroke, right? So this, this, was, not, this was not a candidate for TPA, right? And this did not really require mechanical thrombectomy. This was more of a vasospasm due to hemorrhage causing an infarct. Again, you know, providing immediate uh, direct results for the, for this patient in changing uh, care. Here's an example of another Malawian boy with uh, obstructive heart suffers because of uh, pendemoma internally. I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, looks like there are a lot of questions. <laughs>